Happy March 4th. I'm Dave Harry. In this video, I'm going to be sharing my approach to writing drumline cadences or street beats. You can hear the entire tune towards the end. Let's jump right into the tap off. For the first half of the tap off, I like to have just a traditional accent tap, straight eighth note situation. Then in the second half, we go crazy and show off with some sort of fancy lick. I like to have some sort of melody that I'm creating with the accents and then fill it in with different subdivisions and ornamentation. If you want to have a different section, like the tenors or the basses do a tap off, the same formula will work. You might be wondering, where's the staff paper? Where's Finale? Let me explain my setup and why I work this way, and then we'll get back into the compositional techniques. I like to write, program, and produce the music inside of a digital audio workstation like Ableton Live. This gives more stable and better playback. I have more control over the sounds by programming velocity for every single note. Just easier to mix and make it sound better for a final recording that you can give to people. And you aren't boxed into measures and lines and pages. It just helps the creativity flow easier. In this example, there are two VSTs that I'm using. The first one is the ARIA player with tab space virtual drumline instruments that came with Finale. I'm just using Ableton Live in this case to sequence and program them. These are great samples. They've been around for a long time. They're sort of an industry standard. They sound fantastic. The other instrument I'm using is a Spitfire Audio Originals Drumline. It has a great modern punchy sound. The snare drums are great. I love the cymbal sounds. The bass drums are kind of muddy and hard to mix but the tenor drums only have three drums. <laughs> Come on, Spitfire, give us all the drums. To get these Spitfire drums sounding really, really nice, I recommend turning up the close mic, turn down the room mic, and turn the tightness all the way up on the drums. For the cymbals, they can have more of the room mic and the preset sounds pretty good, so you don't really need to mess with it. Back to the music. The first thing I wanna talk about is the form. Having a preset form gives us a structure that we can fill in and decorate and really make our own. Musical interest is baked into the foundation, and we're able to write more quickly because we already have decisions made ahead of time. I like to use Ableton Live's session view and these scenes to stay organized and really keep track of where I am in the structure. So what is our structure? I like to start with an introduction that's some sort of memorable theme, a groove, something loud, a big opening statement. Then we go into something that contrasts that, maybe something quiet, something more groove-based. Then we go into a solo segment where we let each voice of the ensemble rip. After that, we return to the A section, give the audience something familiar to listen to, add some variation, maybe a full ensemble feature, and then we wrap things back up to the end by returning to the ending of the A theme. The A section should be loud, thematic, groovy, and really is the essence of the entire cadence. I like to think of the drum line as being a four-voice choir. The snare drums are the sopranos, the tenors are the altos, the basses are the tenor voice, and the cymbals really function more as the bass voice. They play less notes, they signal big changes in the music. I'll talk more about cymbal writing later, so stick around. When I'm writing for bass drums, I like to think of there being some sort of groove or ostinato with interjecting melodies and unisons with other voices of the ensemble popping in and out. I like to think of bass five as the kick drum of a drum set. It holds down the groove, really punches through the accents, and the upper drums, I have more split parts going on and they serve more of a melodic role. In a disco or techno beat like this one, I really think there should be some sort of contrast between the big downbeat on beat one and beats two and four. This just leaves more room for the backbeat from the snare drum. In the final version of this, I might have unisons and muffled hits, that sort of thing, uh, but programming it in a digital audio workstation like this, it just gets a little muddy having all those notes playing at once. The tenor drums are the most melodic voice and you can get lots of different colors out of them. I like to use rolls, sweeps, rim shots, they're great for playing in unison with the snare drums, and even better at playing counterpoint. The snares in this example highlight the groove. There's accents where the hi-hat would be, there's rim shots in the backbeat, and then I like to go back and fill that in with different subdivisions and stickings to control the flow and the feel. Let's listen to the entire A section.
Let's get into the groove section. The whole point of this is to contrast what we just heard in the A section. I like to do this by playing at a lower dynamic level. You can use different timbres like rim hits, stick clicks. But I do think it's important that we have a steady pulse, especially if it is at a lower dynamic level. It just helps the full ensemble stay in step when they're marching. But regardless of whatever style the groove is in, it has to be groovy. The snares have a mix of rim and drum hits, simple groove versus melody. There's way more space than in the other sections. The tenors have a backbeat pattern on the Spock with one hand and are playing a melody across the drums with the other. The bass drums are playing an ostinato in the higher drums and have more of a melodic role than in the previous section. The solos. I like to write the features of the quiet section, that way each voice can really jump out of the texture. One technique I use is to move from section to section, going up or down the frequency spectrum. For example, might go bass drums into tenors into snare drums, and this just adds a sense of direction and motion going upwards. The bass drums have split rudiments and runs. There's rolls in the higher drums. It should be playable based on the performers at hand, but also flashy. For tenors, I like to write fast singles and scrapes around the drums with lots of rim shots popping out to make melodies. For the snare drums, I like to use more flams and technical stickings, add some metric modulations, most of all go fast. For any Ableton Live users, you can create different subdivisions like 5, 7, and 9 tuplets by creating equal length MIDI notes for each subdivision plus 1. Select all the notes. Warp markers will appear at the start of the first and last MIDI notes. Drag the second warp marker to fit the notes equally between the desired duration. At the end of the solo section, all the voices come together and we finish it out with a big feature. Altogether, the groove into the solos sounds like this. To end the cadence, we're going to return back to the A section. This gives the audience something familiar and enjoyable to listen to, but then we can introduce some variation to make things more interesting. Here I go into a full ensemble drum feature. We have unison rolls, we have some hocket, we have metric modulation, we start to go over the bar line with some of the phrasing, we have big dynamic changes, and then we end things back where we started at the end of the A section to tie things back together. Here's the entire cadence we just wrote. These are my thoughts on cymbal writing. Do not write too many notes. Cymbals are physically demanding to play and fast passages can be really difficult. Also, cymbals have a very washy sound and they can really cover up what's happening in the rest of the ensemble. Cymbals are great for accents, big unison hits. You can add a lot of groove with different sounds like opening close hi-hats for a drum set feel, pings for the ride sound. Really the best sounds to use are the crash, choke, sizzle, ping, scrape, open and closed hi-hat. Please do not do the thing where you just switch the cymbals together. It always sounds awful and probably is not going to give you the desired effect. Don't be afraid to have moments with more notes that feature the players. You can even push things and get crazy with split ping rolls. The more silence there is, the more space there is for cool visuals. Here's some closing thoughts. Cadences should be fun and groovy. 
They're a great way to flex the wide spectrum of musical muscles that a drumline has to offer. Use more silence. This can help balance out the more difficult flashy licks. Even something simple can feel good to play. The sticking, the articulation, the visual elements, they can all add up to the performer's experience of playing the music. You can use different tempos for your cadence. Sometimes they might lend themselves differently to different subdivisions. For example, 120 might feel good with 16th note, something else might feel different with the triplet subdivision underneath. I like writing at 120 beats per minute. It's easy to work with. If you're playing at other marches that are traditional, they might be the same tempo and you can just keep the pulse going the whole time. It should be easy and fun for the whole ensemble to march to, even the winds and color guard. Short beats are better. You can always just play it again. Cadences should feature and highlight the talents of the performers. It should be entertaining to the audience. There are other cadences that I've written on my YouTube channel. You can check those out to compare it to this one, see how the formula works. I hope you learned something that you can use in your own music making. Let me know if you have any questions.